A very good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Pleasure Craft Safety Forum. My name is Juliana Yao, and I'm delighted to be your host for this morning. So this forum is a first in a series of events under the International Safety at Sea Week 2022, an annual event that is organized by the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore as part of its commitment to promote safety at sea. This morning's session is brought to you by the MPA Pleasure Craft Safety Work Group under the National Maritime Safety at Sea Council, and we certainly hope that will help to create greater awareness of best practices to avoid incidents at sea. So to start, I'd like to invite Captain Richard Howe, Managing Director of the Maritime Claim and Services Private Limited and Yacht Surveys and Services Private Limited for his presentation titled, Yachting Casualties, Photo Illustrated. Captain Howe, please. <laughs> Good morning to you. I apologise for using a stick. It's not just safety at sea that happens. I have stepped off the off my boat on Saturday and uh, did a bit of damage to my leg. So uh, now I'm walking with, uh, walking with a, uh, a walking stick for a change. Just excuse me. I'm just getting my bits and pieces here. Right now, I'm. Uh, I'm a master mariner, I spent 15 years at sea and I was captain at sea and I came ashore and I, I did a lot of sailing uh, since I was a kid and uh, I sailed for UK and Australia and Singapore and Singapore in the Admiral's Cup and Southern Cross Series etc. Uh, so I'm a pretty keen sailor and I did a couple of years sailing around the world by myself, which I must have been nuts, but still I uh, did that. And uh, I've been in Singapore for 42 years and I'm married to a Singaporean. Now we'll get that, that's uh, so you know that I'm, uh, there's a certain things lacking here, I think, if one's so crazy to keep on doing the sailing by yourself. However, uh, I safely did that. Uh, so we get, now I have a company uh, which looks after problems on ships but I also uh, have a, a yacht surveys and services, and we do a lot of work for insurance companies, etc. What I'm going to do now is to show you some photographs of accidents that have happened that I've dealt with during the last 20 years or so. And the first one we're looking at uh, is fires. It's a Sunseeker 82. She was carrying out sea trials on the west coast of Singapore with shore technicians on board. They were all looking at the steering, and in the meantime, a, a fire started in the engine room. We don't know how, uh, but it uh, burnt. And, and so you can see the... Right. There we are. These are a few ones which the uh, Singapore authorities did a fantastic job with and uh, you can see what was happening there. It ended up sinking uh, and having to be salved. The, the, uh, the second one we've got here is a very recent one, uh, which was uh, the headlines in the Straits Times uh, on the marina at Keppel Bay, where a, uh, a, a yacht, a motor catamaran caught on fire. Uh, there were three other yachts in close proximity which also got damaged. Uh, quite severely. Uh, I did the investigation. It's still underway, so I can't discuss the findings, although I'm pretty sure we know exactly what's happened. Uh, but uh, you can see that's part of the, the debris after the uh, fire, and that's what it looked like uh, when uh, it was lifted up out of the water. Uh, it was quite a mess. Uh, there's cleaning up, and you can see how clean it's got. Now, we're now on to... Uh, a, that's all that's left of a, a boat that sunk in Malaysia. And it was a Grand Banks, it caught on fire, and that's what happens. Now, I'm talking about fires, because they're... 
pretty dangerous. And the most common causes that I've found are leaking petrol uh, on the many of these boats that have got inboard, outboard engines. They have the engine in the hull and the outboard. They uh, leak sometimes. They get a leak going into the bilge and uh, someone starts up an engine without using the, the blowers to suck the fumes out of the bilge and or they open the thing and we've got a cigarette and there's a bang and that's happened a lot. Uh, there's also electrical short circuits in the area with inflammable items which was part of that one earlier on in Keppel Bay. Uh, there's, uh, there's cracked or leaking fuel high pressure lines uh, which spray onto the exhaust. That's happened on quite a number of occasions. Gas stoves not being shut off properly at the gas bottle or the stoves having faulty uh, valves or gas detectors. The, so that, they, these are all problems that, that uh, cause fires. Now, there's some results of more fires that I've taken. That boat didn't sink, which is a change, but that's uh, another one there. Uh, there's, now, this is a grounding, and that was a, a very nice boat. Uh, it was an Azimuth 68, which ran aground doing 25 knots. And the reason why it ran aground was because the skipper was told there's plenty of water there, and you cannot trust lots of the charts in, in Indonesia or Malaysia. Uh, but I'll discuss that a little bit later. But the, that's what happened to it. It pushed the uh, eye bracket straight through the hull and it flooded the whole boat. And uh, it, uh, it, whenever the tide came up, the boat filled up with water. So I did put a cement box in, so that stopped the water from coming in. We floated it up and towed it to Singapore, but it was a total loss. It cost more to fix up then uh, it would have to, uh, uh, to just pay off the insurance. So that's what happened there. Now, that's, that's a picture of it there when it's... With, now, this one here is a sloop in the King's Cup, and it, uh, it was another yacht dragged anchor, and it, tripped, it cut this, uh, the, the bow line. The, the chain, the anchor chain, actually came... was connected to a rope so that they could drop it quickly and go racing. And then, uh, anyway, it, it came up and the pitching caused it to break and that was a total loss as well. Uh, it was the, the owner of the boat was not to blame on that one at all. It was just one of these things that happened. Uh, now, there, there's bits and pieces of things that happened. You can see rudders being uh, uh, bots of uh, propellers being damaged, these are just a few things. Now here is a very interesting one. You can see a yacht there, it was taken by, this one was taken before the accident and it was used, taken by a drone. And there is, you can see it arrowed, that's the boat there. And my boat happens to be just along to the left of that. But uh, he was close in shore and he hit deep water where he anchored which is about 13 metres, so he had about 50, 50 metres of cable or more, plus the length of his boat, and when the tide changed, he swung in and went over the top of the reef. And when he went to get off, he thought, well, he'd just kick his engines ahead to, to uh, uh, get closer to the anchor, so it'd make it easier to heave up. Unfortunately, he was sitting on the rocks at that stage, and so the... That's what ended up there with a, uh, a, a broken shaft and uh, a bent rudder. So there's another boat, again, he sank. Uh, didn't go ground, he sank. And uh, because there was a, uh, one of his uh, uh, lines, his cooling water lines, uh, the, the uh, uh, sorry, I'm just, uh, looking for what I had. Uh, yes, he, he, his, uh, I apologize, just one second. Uh, anyway, the, it was the Jubilee Eclipse, 
that hold the cooling water line on, he only had one Jubilee clip and instead of two, and that one Jubilee clip broke off, and so the, the, the boat flooded while he was ashore. He came back, there was no boat. Uh, now, these are common causes of accidents, unfortunately. Uh, now we have, uh, or these are more suffering from, uh, uh, fr from sinking. Now, these, this one is a collision, and it was a collision with a Singapore vessel, uh, but uh, it was down in Port Klang, and that was it coming up. Two people not looking out. The ships, the ships weren't looking out, and neither was the guy on the yacht. And he was just cruising along, and they both had a collision. Uh, and uh, the yacht came off worse. Uh, we, did, we did find out which ship it was. They didn't report it. We did find out which ship it was, and they made restitution. The next one we've got, oh, that's uh, collisions. And you can see the bow on that. And these catamarans are quite dangerous. When they hit something, it, the bow normally splits from the waterline or below the waterline, the forefoot, right up the top. It, it, and so that happens quite a lot. And that's what it looks like when you see these, uh, these messes there. This was a large uh, yacht that uh, ran into a wall. And it didn't do too much good, but it's all fixed up nicely now. And it wasn't enough damage to even reach the deductible. Uh, so it was not so good. Now, there's another collision. I didn't take those photographs, but someone else did uh, for the claim. But uh, someone put the, the, uh, the, 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 th the throttle and gear ahead instead of astern and went straight up the other boat. So these stupid things do happen. Uh, more damage for grounding there, but uh, it's quite a mess. Now, you can see some of these bent propellers. That's so common. It's grounding. People going too close. They're not using uh, their navigation systems properly. Uh, what have we got there? Now, there is a vessel that was left sitting there, a junk, and it was for, uh, it was for the sheriff's auction, and I valued it. I valued it at $1, uh, and they sold it for $9,000, and uh, it had to be towed away from uh, the marina to repair it or whatever they're going to do, and it sank one and a half kilometres away from the marina. So it was rather an expensive one dollar exercise. Uh, and you can see that's the bow of it. When I walked past it, it, was, it had been raining a bit before and I had my umbrella with me and I walked past it and I thought, what's that? And I leant over and gave it a poke with my umbrella and it went straight through the, the hull, which was one reason why I valued it at one dollar. Uh, now there's an unhappy ship. Uh, I, I, was, I was sailing along and I, I'd never seen this before and the way that salt has gone across the, the bulbous bow and I found it was most amusing so I took a photograph of it but it does look rather unhappy. Uh, now this is, a, this is a, a, a classic picture. You can see it was a head-on collision uh, and uh, you can see how badly it was damaged. And there is a picture of the other ship that had hit, and you can see the imprint of its bow straight in there. One was coming across, uh, one was heading uh, westbound, the, 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 big, the one on the, the, uh, the right-hand side of the picture, and the other was coming across eastbound and cutting across to go to the Keppel to pick up the pilot. And the one with that uh, one with a really bent bow went hard as starboard and the other guy went hard a port. And so there was the head-on collision. But, uh, uh, and we couldn't anchor it because his anchors were uh, disappeared into the, into the mess there. So we had to get a buoy and, and put the MPA call, or PSA said, well, you tell us what you're going to do with it. And I went on board and we, we got a, a buoy put down and we moored it stern too. Uh, but these things happen.
These are another uh, few pictures which you might find uh, interesting. Uh, you can see uh, that that was a that. Well, I'm just getting onto my pictures here. Excuse me. Just uh, right. I'm because I can't quite see the pictures there that they're showing. Okay. Uh, the, the one is a. a it was a passenger ship uh, which hit an uncharted uh, uh, reef in the Solomon Islands. And the reef was called, I can't remember, uh, Buffalo Reef or something like that, named after a Royal Navy sailing sh ship back in the 1800s that had run aground there. But it was put down as an, un an uncharted reef. And I went out and there was a, a nice big reef and it had been found in, in the 1800s. So, uh, however, that is still there, that ship, uh, because they couldn't, uh, they couldn't, uh, well, they floated it, and the locals then chased them away. And so they sank again, and uh, uh, that was that. They weren't allowed back, and so now it's a bit of a tourist resort. You can see there also on the, the, the bottom right-hand side, a ship that, hit a, a reef and there's a huge big rock uh, stuck in the ship, which was quite amazing. Uh, on the, the next, uh, have we got the next one down? Uh, here we go. The, you can see that was a collision. The top left hand side, it was uh, hit by a container ship. That ship was on its first maiden voyage and it was hit there. On the right hand side top, there is a, a ship in Dampier which uh, ran aground, lost its steering, and uh, it, it ran aground. Uh, we got it off a couple of, uh, couple of weeks later. On the bottom left, there is, uh, in, in Singapore, uh, it rolled over purely because it was unstable and it sank. Uh, so that was actually salved in Singapore and uh, uh, lifted, so that was a good end. And on the right-hand side was a uh, a ship down in, in Indonesia where they, uh, they lost a thousand tons of, of uh, cargo or fuel oil rather. Uh, but uh, anyway, that was, that was the end of that. We got, we got that ship off and we cleaned up the mess and that was it. Now, we'd, we've talked about collisions, we've talked about uh, running aground, our fires, etc. And all of them, uh, to a certain extent, or sometimes to a large extent, but to a certain extent, they all could have been avoided. Uh, and it's just that we have to get onto the showing people what is necessary uh, to, to uh, uh, prevent these from happening. And that's, I think, what we have to uh, get more to the people that are sailing in Singapore. Thanks very much. That's all for me. Thank you very much, Captain Howe, for your sharing. And of course, happening next on stage, we'll be inviting our second speaker up, and he is none other than Captain William Francis, President of the Singapore Power Boat Association. He will be sharing his experience through his presentation called Observance of Good Seamanship. Captain William, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, fellow boaters. May I um, see by a show of hands those people that have at least owned a power boat, a pleasure craft, at least once in their life? Just a show of hands. How many people still playing with their pleasure crafts? Okay, good. Thank you very much. All right. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow boaters, I love the sea, and I'm sure 
likewise everyone here. I'm happiest when I'm out at sea. My picture of bliss, just like my good friend, Mr. Donald Crabb, my picture of bliss is being anchored in a mirror calm bay off an exotic island with my boating khakis, watching the sunset over a can of beer. Life's better with boating, don't you think so? But like Richard has shown us, in great detail, things can go very wrong. And usually when accidents happen, the inventory of rules and regulations, restrictions and prohibitions tend to also increase. And that's sad. I'm a staunch believer in the freedom of the seas for every citizen. I'm all for the minimization of restrictions and prohibitions governing its use particularly for recreational boaters. So when the same accidents, unfortunately when the same accidents happen again and again, as Richard has shown us, government bodies are expected to take action to prevent those mishaps and promote safety at sea. It is for this reason that the Pleasure Craft Safety Work Group was formed, headed by Captain Charles D'Souza from the MPA, would you like to take a stand, Captain Charles? <laughs> Although everyone knows you here. <laughs> and the deputy for this work group is the Honorable Mr. YP Lok. YP, would you like to take a stand? <laughs> and we had the pleasure recently of being on board YP's um, sailing yacht. Um, he's 70 years young and he'll be spending the next 45 years sailing Indonesian waters. <clears throat> With this work group, it is hoped that through education and soft persuasion, education and soft persuasion, we can eliminate avoidable incidences and hopefully reduce the need for regulatory measures. Now I'm going to start my presentation now. Humble beginnings, slide number one. My sea adventures started with my first sampan ride at Changi Beach in 1964. I've been boating ever since. Today it gives me great pleasure to be at this Pleasure Craft Safety Forum to share my experiences. Now I'll be sharing stories with you, all my personal experiences and how I came about being engaged in pleasure boating. And I still am boating right up to today. I still own a 26-foot uh, Grady White catamaran, and I try to go out to sea at least once every week. Anyway, that's not a picture of me. Huh? That was the only slide I could find on Google. <laughs> uh, but that was exactly the sampan that I took in 1964. Cost a couple of cents to rent it out for the whole day, and we would paddle off to a Kelong, tie off to the Kelong, and catch Pase Pase. Topic for this morning is observance of good seamanship. First, a collection of first principles. Now, when I say first principles, I mean it's first principles are the act of stripping a process down to the core fundamentals and then building up from there. My focus will be on pleasure crafts. These are the six first principles that my team and I have collated have assembled. We hope that they will serve as a visual reminder in the form of a poster to trigger an attitude of safety at sea, especially amongst recreational boaters. Now, the first of these principles is observance of good seamanship. Explain has, I respect the sea, and sea and fellow seafarers, I practice boating etiquette. By the way, if the term boating etiquette is foreign to some of you, um, I actually bought this book uh, called Boating Etiquette about 25 years ago. And Terence reminded me that I probably bought it in Kaohsiung, uh, Taiwan, in many of our travels there. And uh, there's, it's a wealth of knowledge, teaches you a lot of common sense, which is what observance of seamanship is all about. But it, as you and I know, common sense ain't all that common. 
So we have to learn. <clears throat> Second of these principles is know before you go. We believe that knowledge, skills, and attitudes, I'm going to repeat that again, knowledge, skills, and attitudes with lots of experience are core to boating safety. Acquiring them will help you know before you go boating. I will elaborate on these principles with stories. Now, I'm not going to go through the other four principles. I will go through one by one as I share with you my personal stories. Let's start with observance of good seamanship. Now, that's a picture of uh, East Coast Beach in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, that's where I kept my 18-foot sampan. And just on the right, that's the picture of the East Coast Beach where the sampans are kept today. The year was 1975. My first boat was an 18-foot wooden sampan that I bought and parked at the East Coast Beach. I knew absolutely nothing about boats and engines. I was at the very raw stage of, and this is a dangerous stage, huh? I, was, I was at the stage of, I don't know what I don't know, so I fear nothing. Fortunately, a local fisherman named Uncle Lim took me under his wing and taught me the basics. I learned on the job. Those days, all the sampans were parked on the beach above the high water mark. Launching and recovery was done manually, and everybody there would automatically help. It was an unwritten rule, a sort of seafarer's spirit that I followed without question. So the moment a sampan came back from fishing, everybody would rush there and help him pull it up, including the engine. Now, there was one thing I learned from the fishermen there and the boaters there was this frequent message they keep on telling me. They say, look out for Angin Barat. That's called the Sumatras or squalls. These winds will come in the pre-dawn hours and whip up a storm that will capsize a small sampan, and I experienced that firsthand. Story goes like this. It was a dark and stormy night. This morning was a pretty dark and stormy morning also. Four o'clock in the morning, the wind suddenly picked up. It all of a sudden grew chilly. There was a signal to say that the Sumatras were coming, especially off Bado area. My tiny sampan got tossed up and down in the seas that were building up. Huge waves started um, forming, and then the rains came. My little four horsepower Avinrude engine sputtered and finally died. The fuel line was sucking in air. I had to use my oars to get back to shore. Just before I hit the beach, a huge wave came and tossed me onto the beach with me inside the sampan. Luckily, I was not alone. Other fishermen had suffered the same fate. They came to my aid and dragged the boat with me inside up the beach. I huddled under a tree, shivering and waiting for the morning to come. This experience taught me a lot. Never underestimate the fury of the sea, especially if you're in a small boat. Watch the weather. Respect fellow boaters. Be humble and ask for help. Be courteous always. In later years, when I joined the Navy, I learned the meaning of my experiences summed up in a single phase. It's simply put, observance of good seamanship. I respect the sea, described as I respect the sea and fellow seafarers, I practice boating etiquette. So that's lesson number one. Observance of good seamanship. Basically, using your kidney. Well, the second principle, first principle is know before you go. I joined the Navy in 1978. The slogan was join the Navy and see the world, and so I did. But instead of sailing to exotic destinations like Hawaii or Tahiti or even the Philippines or Indonesia, uh, my first trip in 1979, we sailed to Cochin. 
Colombo, Djibouti, and Sudan. And I'm proud to say that two of my fellow seafarers are actually with me this morning. Uh, we sailed together in an LST, traveled about 2,200 nautical miles, and finally reached Djibouti. Would you take a stand, Mr. Krishnan? <laughs> I just had to do this. So that's one of my fellow seafarers. The other one is Mr. Donald Kratt. Okay, Donald, thanks. Anyway, those days knowing where you were at sea and where you were going was not so simple. We had a DECA radar. It worked most of the time. We had Loran, uh, which is radio fixing aids. Never worked since the first day I went on board the ship. And then we had the Sexton. That was the only reliable source of navigation that we had. En route to Djibouti, 2,200 nautical miles away, via the Arabian Sea, we caught a massive storm. And this storm actually lasted for the entire stretch of our journey there. It was about sea state 8, 65 knots of wind, uh, more than 120 kilometers per hour. We couldn't take sun sights, star sights, and moon sights for about 12 days. Now, those days, the sexton was the only instrument we had to take fixes in the open ocean. So after 12 days of no sights, we were lost. But if we, if we, if we could take a sight, once you took a fix, then you charted it on your, on your chart, you drew a track, did date reckoning, predicted your position based on date reckoning until the next fix was established, which we didn't have for the next 12 days. So after 12 days, we didn't know exactly where we were, but we continued heading west towards the Gulf of Aden. And one day, when we were not too far away from the Gulf of Aden, and so we thought, we saw a passing ship. And we were very excited. We went on Channel 16, we called up the passing ship, got the name using our binos, and we called up the captain of the ship and said, could you give us your lead and long position? Guess what was the response? we were going to ask you the same thing. <laughs> Both of us were as lost as ever. Anyway, that's, that's how it was back then. Today, all that is absolute history. Global positioning system, chart plotters, have changed navigation forever. Today, I know where I am, where I'm going. I use a chart plotter. I even have navigation apps on my mobile phone. Now, that's the navigation app that I have on my mobile phone. I use Navionics. It's almost impossible to get lost at sea nowadays with GPS and chart plotters, unless, of course, the battery runs out. After having gone through an era of taking bearings and fixes to fix the ship, and it's really cumbersome, one section fix, 45 minutes of calculations. After having gone through that, I cannot understand why anyone would save money on a chart plotter or on a Navionics app. Because with that, you know exactly where you are all the time. You'll know where you are, where you're going. I use charts in a chart plotter. I have navigation apps on my handphone. I recognize local islands, buoys, and beacons. So that's point number two, know before you go. Very heavy emphasis on navigation. Third, first principle. We certainly have one of the busiest harbors in the world. More than a thousand ships at any one point come in and out of Singapore waters. My next story is actually uh, one of my fishing expeditions of Halsburg Lighthouse. Again, everything happens at four o'clock in the morning when it's stormy. So this was four o'clock in the morning. I was on board a 28-foot center console with a single engine off Horsburg Lighthouse. Earlier in the morning, earlier in the day, we had lost our anchor, got stuck under the reef. And then now we were just drifting off Horsburg Lighthouse, still catching fish and waiting for the morning to come so we could sail back to Singapore. Five o'clock in the morning, one by one, each of us kind of dozed off, which is a bad thing, including me. I must have dozed off for about five minutes or so, I thought. 
When I woke up, I had a shock of my life. All I saw, this was off Hausberg, 28-foot vessel, right? So when I sort of got off, woke up from my little five-minute slumber, all I saw was complete pitch black. No moon, no stars, no backscatter of shore lights, just pitch black. So I thought, ah, the moon has settled. I got the shock of my life when I heard the sound of an engine. I was actually looking at the freeboard of a merchant ship that was painted black, of course, right? And it was only a couple of yards from me. And that ship hadn't seen me at all. <clears throat> a few seconds later, I sud all of a sudden I saw it. The wake of the ship. And then the moon came out, the stars came out, and a backscatter of shore lights. I was only a couple of yards away. And then I realized one thing, I had failed to keep a lookout. Big lesson. And if you can't see the bridge of the ship, they suddenly can't see you. You know, many months later, in 2003, at that same stretch of sea of Horsburg Lighthouse, a merchant ship collided with a Navy patrol vessel. Unfortunately, there were four fatalities. So keeping a lookout, really important. So now whenever I'm out in a boat, I automatically keep a vigilant lookout. I take bold and early action to avoid collision. I especially make sure I don't impede the safe passage of ships along fairways. I never insist my right of way when it comes to merchant ships. If I can't see the bridge, they certainly can't see me either. <clears throat> Pause for a while. Slide. Fourth principle. Your boat is supposed to keep you above water, and it's so comfortable when you're dry. But if your boat ever sinks, you better stay afloat. When in doubt, put on a life jacket. If your boat has capsized but is still afloat, better to stay with the boat and wait for rescue to come. It's easier to spot a boat with a single, uh, e easier to spot a boat than a single head bobbing in the water. So stay afloat, when in doubt, put on a life jacket. Infants, I personally feel that for infants 12 years and below, make it compulsory for them to put on a life jacket. Let's talk a bit about maintenance. Now, this was the biggest scare that I had when it came to maintenance. Huh? I describe maintenance, or explain maintenance as this. My boat is my life raft. I service it regularly. Unlike ships and bigger mega yachts or super yachts with lifeboats, the boat, a boat or pleasure craft has only got life boys and life jackets. So better maintain your boat. The biggest care I experienced was actually flooding. I was out fishing. This time I was in Singapore waters. On the boat itself, I have what we call the live bait well. It's a sports fishing boat. So the live bait well would pump seawater into a tank and it will run continuously to keep the bait alive. So we use live prawns and tambans and all that for fishing. Again, I don't know why my stories are such, but true story, this again happened at about four or five o'clock in the morning. We were fishing overnight off one of the southern islands and uh, I suddenly realized that, A, the, the boat seems to be listing to port. Can't be. I was on board a catamaran. And uh, the list became more and more pronounced. I said, something is very wrong. Normally, if there's water in the bilges, the float switch would activate, and then they'll pour the water out. But this time, the pumps were silent, and I didn't hear any water being discharged. So a lot of things were running through my head. I quickly opened up the bilge hatch, and to my horror, the pot bilge pump was flooded. I didn't understand why. But the first thing I did was, I went to the console panel, manually activated the pot bilge pump, and thank God, the bilge pump worked. I didn't know whether the hull had been breached. Numerous thoughts went through my head, wondering why the bilge pump didn't activate. 
And most importantly, where was that water coming from? After much confusion and checks, I found the culprit. You wouldn't believe it. It was a live bait well. You see, the live bait well brings water from the sea into the boat. There was a hose clip from the bilge pump to the live bait well. And unfortunately, this was a very poor quality hose clip that I put on, not like this particular one that I have here. And over the years, the hose clip had rusted through and it had broken. So instead of pumping water into the live bait well, the live bait well pump was pumping it into the bilges. What a scare that was. I switched off the bait pump, emptied the water in the bilges, and when I got back to shore, I changed all my hose clips. Finally, a commitment to safety. As a, skipper of my, as a skipper, the safety of my boat, crew, and guests, and the environment is my responsibility. I always tell the crew and guests to keep a lookout and inform me when we're in close quarters situations. I tell them where the life jackets are stored and to put one on if they can't swim. I even tell them where to put their shoes. I do it intentionally so that my guests know that they're on board a boat, they're not a passenger in a car, and that guests are expected to help the skipper. So they quickly realize that there are rules to observe in a boat, and they help me along, especially when it comes to lookout. So commitment to safety, I'm going to repeat that again. As a skipper, the safety of my boat, crew and guests, and the environment is my responsibility. Now, there is a saying, when the sea is calm, every boat has a great captain. Unfortunately, that doesn't, we don't have those conditions all the time. And I like this saying, a good seaman weathers a storm he cannot avoid, and avoids the storm he cannot weather. So ladies and gentlemen, in summary, no activity and no individual exists for the primary purpose of being safe. We exist so we live, so we experience, and so we have fun in this, life, in this short lifetime of ours. Sensible people understand that risk is part of living and that no amount of compliance Rules and regulations, restrictions and prohibitions will ever eliminate the inherent dangers that come from going out to sea in a boat. A good seaman weathers a storm he cannot avoid, and avoids a storm he cannot weather. Remember that. Nobody, not even an authority, should ever claim to care more about your safety than you. In the end, no amount of compliance can replace the role of personal responsibility. And while governments and associations have a role to play in eliminating as much risk as possible from recreational boating activities, safety is ultimately our responsibility. Nobody should be more concerned about your safety on the water than you. The reality is quite obvious. On the water, out there, in the open ocean, nobody is watching over you to tell you that you're being unsafe. And I've never come across a captain that didn't know what he was doing, but he was doing it right. Have you? Hence the mantra, safety begins with me, says it all. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. On behalf of the MPA, the Singapore Powerboat Association, the Singapore Boating Association, the Singapore Maritime Academy, and the Singapore Sailing Federation, I thank you for your presence here, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Captain William. Thank you for sharing your personal stories. Definitely six valuable lessons we'd like to keep in mind. So ladies and gentlemen, as we move into the panel discussion right now, we'll also like to invite you to join in our panel session by logging into Pigeonhole. So please do scan the QR code that's on the large screen right now or simply launch your internet browser and key in www.pigeonhole.com.
AT in the address bar. Next, you'll want to key in our event pass code, and that would be safety at C. So I'm going to give you a couple of uh, seconds to do just that. I'm very sure everybody is very familiar with using the QR code function. You'll be able to input your questions uh, for the panel discussion later on. But now that that is out of the way, I would also like to tell you a bit more about our panel discussion for today. So the topic of discussion would be best practices to avoid incidents at sea. And for this, I would like to invite our moderator, Mr. Terence Ho, Executive Director of the Singapore Sailing Federation on stage. Mr. Ho, please. Hello, everyone. A very good morning to each and every one of you. Thank you for investing your very precious Monday morning with us. Uh, we hope to make this a very fruitful session for each and every one of you. Um, just show of hands, who's alive this morning? Come on, come on. Yes, yeah, great. Yep, yep, a few of you are alive. Thank you very much for responding. Uh, great to see all of you. Um, so, how many of you here have witnessed firsthand a accident or near miss at sea? Right, come on, higher, higher. Yep, yep, most of you. And how many of you then at that point in time have wished that more could be done for safety at sea? What could the regulators have done? What could the police have done? What could the association have done? What could the schools have done? And that's why we are here today. We are here to have this panel discussion and we are fortunate enough um, you know, for the organizers to allow the Pleasure Craft Safety Work Group to kick off this very important Safety at Sea Week. Yep. So I, I hope today's discussions or, or later uh, will give you new perspectives, new strategies as you go about your boating business, either professionally or personally, to make boating safety part of your culture, part of your ethos, part of your life. Okay, so um, has everyone keyed in their questions into, into the system? I, I'm sure... Yeah, otherwise, um, it'll be a very short session. No? If you guys don't have, a question, don't have many questions, I mean, I'm smart, but I'm not that smart, right? So I'm going to only have a couple. But if you guys don't contribute, then um, we've, we've, uh, it's an opportunity missed. So um, I, I think it's now time for me to just invite my panel back on stage. Uh, you've heard from them. So I'd like to re-invite uh, Captain Richard Howe and Captain William Francis back onto the stage to take your seats, please. Gentlemen. Next on stage, I'd like to invite someone that, if you have a PPCDL, I hope most of you have, um, you'll be very familiar with him and his team of invigilators who are the gatekeeper of our PPCDL. I'd like to invite Senior Lecturer at the Singapore Maritime Academy, Captain Sawan Osman, onto the stage, please. Captain Sawan. Our next panelist leads a team of people that you hope not to meet at sea, right? Uh, those of you who have been fishing a little bit too close to Jurong Island, sorry, to Pulau Sabaro, yeah, a bit too close to Pulau Bukom, you may have met his men in red, white, and blue, right? Um, please uh, welcome on stage Police Superintendent Desmond Ong, Commanding Officer, Bani Region, Police Coast Guard. And of course, Life at sea without this group of people would be lawless. And so I'd like you guys to welcome Captain Sean Ho up on stage, Assistant Director for Marine Safety and the Environment and Deputy Portmaster, Maritime Port Authority. Captain Sean, please. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So, <laughs> a bit awkward. Um, I guess uh, it just leads me to, I'll, I'll, lead, I'll let everyone introduce themselves a little bit. Uh, gentlemen, you have a microphone next to you. Uh, just a little bit about your experience uh, and why basically you're here this morning. So maybe we'll start with um, Captain Sean, please. Hi. Uh, good, morning, every good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean, and uh, I'm the head of department for the Marine Environment and Safety Department in MPA. I'm also concurrently the deputy portmaster. 
So my team uh, deals uh, very work very closely with the pleasure craft industry. Um, we carry out audits for the PPCDL training centers. Uh, we investigate the uh, incidents at sea, especially uh, pleasure craft related incidents. And uh, yeah, during COVID time, we also work closely with uh, pleasure craft. Uh, agent operators uh, in regards to crew change or SMM measures. So my team um, work closely with the pleasure craft industry. Happy to be here uh, to address uh, any safety related issues today. Thank you. Yeah. Morning, everyone. I'm Desmond from the Police Coast Guard. So I'm the commanding officer of a Brani region. So we are responsible for the southeastern waters of Singapore from Changi all the way to Labrador. So um, I think from police perspective, we work very closely with the maritime port authorities for all uh, maritime related uh, matters. And in fact, um, we are also um, trying to actively engage some of the associations, like for example, the Boating Association, the Sailing Federation, um, when there are activities. So we look into, we will work closely with them uh, to look at, uh, for example, what will be some of the safety concerns that uh, police need to be aware of. Um, for us, we are also responding to all maritime incidents. I think, as earlier mentioned by Mr. Terence, uh, you tr hope not to meet my guys. Um, we, we are basically there to enforce law and order, but at the same time, uh, being part of the maritime uh, community out there, so we are also responding to any uh, vessels in distress, uh, vessels in need of assistance. So uh, we partner very closely with MPA in such areas. So. Uh, very thankful to be invited here today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Captain Shawan. I'm a senior lecturer with Singapore Maritime Academy. I'm also the course chair of Diploma in Nautical Studies. Um, my background, of course, is the master mariner, uh, sailing on different types of ships. And I've been a dock master with Raffles Marina, Marina manager with SAF Yacht Club before I joined uh, Singapore Polytechnic, Singapore Maritime Academy. Uh, one of my other responsibility is in charge of PPCDL uh, examination uh, on behalf of MPA. So I look into PPCDL exam matters and we also, uh, from time to time, uh, we study the statistic given by MPA and we try to close the gap during the assessment, uh, especially during the practical examination. Yep. So I can see some of the candidates that have passed or have failed before <laughs> in the audience. Okay, see you later. Thank you. Okay, so thank you uh, everyone for your debt. Uh, good introduction. Um, I think it's a segue and it's a good starting point. Uh, Captain Sawan mentioned something about um, hearing about the incidents that happened at sea and then trying to bridge that knowledge gap. And I, I, as I understand it from, uh, from the MPA, the most common incident or pleasure craft incident at sea, uh, can anyone guess what it is? What's the most common accident at sea when it comes to pleasure craft? Collisions, anyone else? Sorry, uh, Roy? Grounding, Ariel, thank you. Anyone else? Fire? Okay, so, yeah, great. All those happens, but unfortunately, the, the most common is, is actually grounding. Yeah, um, I, I hope none of you here have uh, personally experienced it. But maybe um, I, I would I'd like to ask this to the panel. Uh, what do you think, uh, in your, maybe in your, your own perspective, your own experience, what do you think would be one or couple great measures to avoid a grounding or general advice you can give? Uh, Richard, you'd like to start us off? I think it's on, it's on, yeah, just speak, yeah. Hello? Yes. The, uh, the common cause of grounding is lack of attention. Uh, there can be other reasons, but lack of attention is the main thing. And if you are not keeping an eye on your navigation, you are liable to run aground. One of the other things can be a major distraction. And the only time that I've run aground was when there was a, a youngster, a seven-year-old lass was, uh, I saw her, I was steering from down below, and I saw this young lass 
uh, with a leg hooked around the, the one of the stanchions, and she was trying to touch the uh, touch the water from the bow wave, and all I could see was one leg there and holding on, and I just pulled both of my throttles back uh, uh, to to neutral, and went rocketing out to go and grab her before she went under because she could have gone back and hit the propellers, uh, but uh, unfortunately I only pulled one of them uh, not to neutral. It was and uh, I went round there to drag her out, and I was actually fairly close to the point which I was going around. And whilst I was pulling her up, we ran aground. So uh, you can be distracted, uh, and. I certainly was, and uh, I learned from that. I, even at my ripe old age of about 75 at the time, I still uh, learned that uh, you can be distracted. So that's the main thing I've got to say. Thank you. Yep, really? Um, the difference between a merchant ship and a pleasure craft is this. Huh? Merchant ships avoid reefs, shoals, shallow areas. They've got deep drafts. Pleasure crafts, recreational crafts, we get attracted by shoals, reefs, and shallow areas. And sometimes we beach, which you're not supposed to. Um, as a pleasure craft owner, there are two things that you must have. You've got to spend the money on these two things. You've got to get yourself a chart plotter. Not just a GPS, but a chart plotter and one that works. Anyway, they last a long time. The second thing that you must have on your boat is a fish finder or an echo sounder. Comes quite cheap nowadays. So with these two tools, it should keep you fairly safe. Now, the shocking thing is this. Huh? Um, I've seen really small boats get grounded, and you won't believe how small these boats are. They're known as PWCs or jet skis. So the story goes like this. So this is a friend of mine. He's on board a jet ski. He likes to go fast. And, and I, I'm, I'm glad he's enjoying the sea. And he says, William, I just cannot understand it. Yesterday, I passed through this stretch of water. I was perfectly fine. Today, same time, I passed through this stretch of water. I got grounded. How come? <laughs> and I tell them, tides. The range of tides in Singapore that rise and fall, on the average, is about three meters. So the third thing that you need to look out for, and you can use your handphone app for this one, is check the tides. At low tides, some reefs in Singapore waters are exposed. Thank you. Okay, uh, although Captain William encouraged us to use uh, apps and technology, but I would like to uh, give a caution that over-reliance on equipment can also lead to grounding if the equipment fails, right? So you have to uh, verify the fact or the information that is provided by your equipment before you, you know, 100% uh, uh, relying on that equipment. So you have to do cross-check. For example, if you have a GPS position, it's better to cross-check with bearings and all that so that you know your GPS is working well. Uh, likewise for the tide, uh, it's always good to have a tide table on board so that you can verify your equipment, whether it's giving the correct reading and that you know that it's reliable. Thank you. Yeah, um, I guess uh, they have covered quite a fair bit. I think uh, for those who are operating in Singapore, I one thing that we need to be very aware of is that in Singapore, our waters are constantly changing. I mean, there's a lot of reclamation works going on. Uh, I think as pleasure craft community, um, aside from relying on technology or charts, I think you need to be aware of works that are happening almost day by day. Um, an area that you traverse one week ago or even a month ago will be very different a month later if the area of concern is being reclaimed. I think in Singapore's context, this is something that is very common. Um, it's going to be happening quite rampantly. I think for those who are in the East Coast, will be aware that they are going to be extending our shorelines outwards under the URA plan. So I think as part of the community, you need to rely on all the uh, Port Marine circulars um, that is available online, in fact. You don't need to subscribe to a hard copy. You just go onto your mobile app, go on MPA app, and you can read up on all these advisories and keep well clear of these uh, shallows, and that will save you from grounding. Thanks.
Hi, um, from for MPA's perspective, with regards to uh, incident invest, uh, responding to incidents involving pleasure craft, yes, grounding has uh, is the. I mean, we, we see the largest number of incidents involving pleasure craft to be grounding. And uh, on average, we see around four or five grounding incidents in Singapore. Um, for me, I think uh, the biggest issue is uh, with regard to local knowledge of the master. Um, I think some has been brought up already. I just want to elaborate a bit more on local knowledge. Uh, you learn that in PPCDL, uh, but once you go out in, in, into sea, um, it's important that you know where you are. Yes, you use sharp water, like uh, Captain Sawan has uh, mentioned. It's also important to you know visually identify uh, important landmarks, boys, beacon, in addition to the use of electronic aids. Um, particularly for grounding incidents, we, um, we see that it, it happens more often in areas like um, Siren Reef um, and also the northeastern area between Changni, Tekong and Ubin. So uh, my advice to the boaters is that uh, when you go out to sea, um, do a proper passage planning, know where you are going, um, be familiar with the tides. Um, once you are there, um, do constant plotting so that you know where you are and you keep away from shallow waters to avoid crowding. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Um, actually, this, this um, let, let me just try to see that this works. If I press active, does it go on the... Uh, okay, um, I, I think if you guys look at your uh, apps, you would see that uh, one, one common question that everybody's asking, and it's actually quite related to what we we're talking about. Uh, right now, the PPCDL is valid for life, right? Once you get it. Um, so the, the question from the floor is, is there any thinking or should we, should we, um, yeah, here we go. Uh, yeah. You know, how often do, should boaters, if at all, be refreshed in their basic safety principles, in their boating skills, in their boating knowledge. Um, I, I guess if it's a common question from the floor, some of you think that, that there should be, or there is some merit, that it could be a, I mean, maybe a yearly test, right? No. Uh -huh. um, but what, what is the panel thing? A anyone? Um, if at all, or, or should we, or is there a better way to do this, uh, to keep people uh, aware, people on their toes, people current? Someone? Yep. Yeah. Uh, for those who have obtained the attend the PPCDL and they have no boat of their own, so the knowledge would deteriorate over time. Yeah, uh, but there are chartering companies that uh, before they are allowed to charter the boats, they are required to go through a, a, some kind of uh, revalidation before they are allowed to drive the the boat that they intend to charter. Yeah. For boat owners, I guess over time, they, with their experience, they will have more knowledge and, uh, and most of the boats are both at marinas and marinas uh, and yacht club usually would conduct some uh, uh, flotilla sail together. So they learn from the uh, marina personnel. Like for example, when I was at Raffles Marina, I lead a flotilla to Anambas, uh, to Phuket, and all that. So those boaters would have learned from, uh, by following such flotilla. Uh, they do passage planning, uh, and they know how to avoid uh, danger area because we do briefing before we embark on the flotilla. Thank you. Thank you. Richard. With regards to ships, uh, when I was at sea, uh, you had to uh, show what you had been doing, and if you were actively engaged on ships at sea, uh, then you did not uh, weren't being re-examined. But if you came ashore, then if you wanted to go back to sea again, you had to uh, do a renewal of your certificate, which was not uh, the same as sitting the whole exam again, but it was you had to show that you're up to date. 
and I do believe that if uh, someone who has got their PPL uh, license and does not do any boating at all, they should have a refresher. Uh, I think the refresher should be on a practical side, uh, possibly even having to reset the or redo the actual practical test to show that they could manoeuvre a boat, but uh, not to have to do things like remember all the light f sequences of places in Singapore and saying, oh, uh, what's such and such light characteristics, which I do believe is being asked now. And I think that, frankly, is uh, pretty stupid because they forget them that uh, one week after they've finished their exam, they've forgotten all about these lights. So, but they'll spend ages learning them to, for the exam and they forget it. So I think that it's a very good thing to have a re-examination, but for people that cannot show, cannot prove that they've been actively uh, using their license. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe you just one more response before we move on. Your final response. Huh? <laughs> the best way to learn how to do something is to do that something you're trying to learn. This is especially true when it comes to power pleasure boating, recreational boating. Now, if you're a new boater and uh, you passed your PVCL many years ago, obviously you'll be a little rusty, but at least you had the one-time experience to study in a classroom environment, to go out in a Dynaglass 20DX, and to get your PPC at least once. Could be many years ago, but at least once. That one-time experience will at least set you on the right path to knowing what you don't know and what you have to. From my perspective, the best way to get yourself on board boating again, if you hadn't been boating for a long time, or haven't even started in the first place because you couldn't afford to buy a boat, is to get an experienced boater along with you the first time you go out to sea. Pleasure crafts come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Let's just say that you bought a, a you start off with a small boat, a 26 footer, center console, single engine. Now, there's so many things to learn, right? Just now I went through first principles. Maintenance, knowledge will be zero. Look out, you can do. Driving the boat, navigation, knowing where you are, where you're going, learning lo local knowledge, that takes some time. Now, the fastest way to learn really is apprenticeship. Get a friend, a seasoned guy, get him to go with you. Only go out during the daytime, sunrise to sunset for the time being. Once you get your seaman legs, once you understand the, the common sense of, having, of operating the boat, you'll be a safer boater for sure. And then you, you have to grow from confidence to confidence by going out to sea again and again and again until that knowledge is set in your, in your head, until you develop the basic skills and understand the dangers. But right at the very beginning, I would suggest that you get a friend, which is what I think most boaters do, and get him to show you the ropes. Thank you, William. I guess, um, uh, to, in summary, uh, I'm glad to, no one has said we should, we, we need more regulation. We need more rules. We need to tell people that your license expires unless you attend a class. Um, I think in the spirit of seamanship, right, it, it's a lot of self-awareness. You need to know what you don't know, right? You know, um, I, I know it sounds funny, right? You need to know what you don't know, but unfortunately, that has to be the way that we prescribe um, or, or share that lesson with, with all our friends in our communities, in our own circles of influence, we need to tell our friends, if, if you haven't touched a, a helm in a couple of months, couple of years, I think you need to go out with someone else, right? That, that, that's, I think, the healthy way, and that's a more sustainable way of moving forward rather than making it uh, a compulsory refresher course. So, uh, thank you. Um, and, I mean, that also links to the, the next question. Um, the, the power boaters 
sailors are not the only ones using the water space, right? We've got kayakers, we've got SUP users, windfall boards, open water swimmers and divers. Uh, are there any, I, any suggestions how we can get them involved in this, in this forum as well? Uh, you know, I, I think everyone here, anybody here open water swimmer? No, yeah. So everyone here is a, a pleasure craft user. Is there a way, is there a great suggestion of how we can get more of them involved, all the sea space users involved, to come for these, these forums or to listen, to chime in, uh, and, and, and to understand uh, that it takes two hands to be safe at sea? Yes. I think the way to get people uh, listening and learning is to do it in an enjoyable fashion. Uh, for instance, to have the yacht clubs have a, uh, an evening uh, where maybe there might be a barbecue or something like that. And uh, then they say, right, uh, all our members and anybody else likes to come along. It'll cost you for the barbecue. Uh, but we will have a couple of speakers that will be talking practical uh, experienced people uh, having a talk and giving them a few hints about various things and what's gone wrong and what look what to look after and if people enjoy going there and seeing their mates and having a nice evening but also having a uh, I won't say a lecture but a talk uh, about some of these matters of safety or things to do or things that have changed in Singapore and to look after then that might educate a lot of people in a nice way. Yes, great suggestion. Oh, Sean. Hi. Um, these, these, uh, these are the craft that uh, are non-powered. So um, they normally operate closer to shore, but, but to get them on board in regard to, you know, safety at sea uh M mpa does that you know when we engage them uh, especially at the perhaps the association level um any sea sports related association level or even at the schools level we we engage them when they uh, say they apply for permits to carry out activity at sea so this is when we engage engage them uh, definitely just to make sure that they are aware um Again, about local knowledge, safety, uh, especially we will share with them information with regards to you know, movements of vessels in port, how they conduct uh, activities safely at sea. Uh, on MPA side, uh, we also published, uh, a few years back, we also published a booklet on, uh, um, I believe it's a small craft guidebook. So that contains information for um, persons doing recreational sea sports activity as well. Um, for perhaps kayakers, canoeists, uh, we have also published information on uh, guidelines on how to stay safe when they are doing kayaking and uh, canoeing activities while at sea. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for, uh, for those suggestions. I mean, uh, reaching out to the, to the associations, to the federations, making it fun and enjoyable, I think that's great. Uh, being the, uh, I mean, I run a federation myself, that just, uh, you know, I have just had to look back and actually I haven't planned any uh, such talks for my own federation. So that will definitely happen in my next work year. So thanks, uh, thanks for that suggestion. Um, um, it just now Richard also uh, alluded to the fact that there are regulations that apply to the IMO, and, and that's, that's well regulated. But maybe th someone has asked, uh, does, does the panel see a lax attitude in the industry when it comes to managing and operating uh, their own craft? So for, um, you know, and it's related to, th to this. To become a charter boat captain, the hurdle is not, not really high, right? Um, unfortunately, there, there are... There are varying qualities, uh, varying experiences, varying standards about how we choose our charter boat captains. What does the panel think about uh, a way ahead that we can you know, have a sort of bridge? Uh, of course, um, the IMO regulations are all the way up, up there, but is there a bridge that we can use for, for owners, operators, crew of SZH uh, boats, uh, particularly in Singapore? Yes, Sawan, thank you. Okay, pertaining to the regulations, 
our local MPA regulation actually adopt the regulations from IMO International uh, Coalition regulations or rule of the road. Uh, of course, for PPCDL, we do not require them to memorize the 38 or 40 rules by heart, but we do, uh, from the point of assessment, there are important critical rules, for example, uh, uh, risk assessment, uh, collision uh, assessment, risk of collision assessment, rule seven. We emphasize that during the examination. That is very important. Uh, so if a person has gone through the PPCDL training and then passed the, finally passed the PPCDL assessment, they would have already attained a certain uh, competency. And if they are uh, captain of uh, chartering companies, and I understand there are chartering companies, they have their own uh, standards when they, when they go about uh, employing people to, to be the master of their fleet of charter boats. Uh, so uh, these are layers of uh, controls that we have that ensure that the person who drives the pleasure craft is of a certain, has a certain competency. For the attitude, we, we can't control human attitude. It depends on the person background, the person, uh, um, after he passed, we can't ensure whether he really follow and all that. So, but the, the regulations that we adopt is already uh, quite sufficient in my, from my point of view for PPCDL. And in addition to that, we also introduced, uh, MPA introduced uh, advanced PPCDL. So for those who are required to operate a boat more than 24 meters, they have to go through another uh, training, uh, higher level training, and, uh, and they go through the, another assessment before they are able to operate uh, that kind of size of boat. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, are there standards that we should uh, we should impose before someone becomes a you know a charter boat captain, for example? Yeah, short of IMO regulations, of course. But um, yeah, um, as a fellow boater, I I believe in our I believe in our boating community actually, and I rather self-regulate than have uh, an authority regulate us. This is what I've observed when it comes to boating, pleasure boating in Singapore. Number one, we are already, we are already um, congregated into communities. Before the, Mar before the marinas were formed, um, boating was a kind of loose thing. Either you're in the west coast area or you're up in Pongol, and then the fishing fleet will be at Marine Parade area off the east coast. But today, boaters are congregated into specific communities which we call marinas. Uh, there are seven marinas in Singapore, if I include Changi Sailing Club. And within each marina, they have their own community, they have their own peer pressure and so on and so forth. They know what's happening. Now it's very unfortunate that when it comes to Singapore, we've got so many boats and it's growing, the population. I know the waiting period to, to put your boat in uh, one degree 15, it's about two years, right, to put your boat in the water. So the population of boats have grown. Population of boaters have definitely grown over the last 23 years, and that's a very good thing. And the other wonderful thing, like I said, is that we already congregated into communities. So I believe in peer pressure within the community, and to get that particular community, that marina or sailing club, to actually um, use soft persuasion and education to make sure that our boaters behave themselves and observe good seamanship and boating etiquette when they're out at sea. I guess the issue with Singapore is this. Um, there's not many places that you can go to. So if you're from Keppel or 1 degree 15, most of the boats on the weekend will congregate off Lazarus. And that's where incidences or things happen where you've got to share that limited, very, very limited sea space with the charter boat fleet. They like to launch and play with their tow toys. And I, I don't see anything wrong with that. I think they should do that. But they've got to compete with 
anglers. Um, I think there's uh, some people dive there also. Plus, you've got jet skis that like to take shelter off leisures when the sea is rough. So it's a case of very limited space, plenty of boaters, especially over the weekend. So how do we, how do we operate and how do we relate to each other? It's got to build up very slowly with mutual respect and get the mariners to put in peer pressure. And every time an incident happens, self-regulate, rather than depend on a government body or an association to, to burden you with more rules and regulations. Because I, I really feel that only boaters understand boaters. Thank you. Thank you, William. Um, again, so we're hearing self-regulation is the way to go. We need to leverage on the clubs, uh, the marinas, the associations, uh, you know, where, where boaters congregate to spread that message uh, right before, uh, you know, the, the government does something about it, right? So, you know, so let's help ourselves uh, make or keep boating enjoyable. Um, we, this is a very interesting question. I mean, it's something that came up in the news, actually. Uh, people are asking about the blue barrels over at Sentosa. First question, do you know who, who, who owns the blue, those blue barrels? Oh, okay, so yeah, so some people uh, got the right answer. A lot of people call the MPA and then complain about the blue barrel, but actually uh, not theirs. Lah, yeah? So uh, maybe we'll, we'll let um, Desmond from the PCG explain uh, a little bit more about the blue barrels. And um, you know, sometimes they, are they really a safety hazard? Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, for the blue barrels of, from Police Coast Guard, we call them the floating sea barrels or FSB. Um, this is actually part of our overall um, maritime security um, defense um, where we harden certain um, vulnerable coastlines with uh, these FSBs actually to prevent uh, small craft threats from landing on our shores. Um, but we are not looking at basically uh, fencing up the whole of Singapore. It's not possible to do that. Uh, our waters are very busy. So there are certain stretches that we have made actually very conscious uh, safety as well as security considerations to put in place those FSBs. I, I know Santosa used to be one of the hot topic about why are there so many uh, um, floating sea barriers uh, around the island. Um, this is really because of the, the risk, I mean the risk assessment that we have made. Um, and these are areas where we place, um, which actually do not get in the way of any uh, maritime traffic. So this is actually done in conjunction with MP as well, consulting uh, where we can place them. And we actually have our proper navigation marks there um, put in place to indicate their locations. Um, as of today, I think largely the incidents that we see involving our FSB um, largely involve the non-motorized communities, which are the kayakers, um, because they like to kayak close to some of these barriers, and when they capsize, their kayaks get stuck at our barriers. So we are working, we are actually reaching out with uh, this community. In fact, we have actually come up with some infographics to share with them. Recently, I met up with the Singapore Paddle Club that operates at Sentosa, actually to advise their, their members actually to, um, on some of the safety considerations um, when they are um, engaging in their recreational activities near our barriers. But I think on the whole, I think the consideration of having these barriers really more from the security perspective that we have decided that we have worked on it and uh, put this in place. Um, but at the same time, we are also reviewing with the kind of uh, implements that could be put in place to reinforce our maritime security. So, I mean, the barriers are there now, um, but I wouldn't say that it will look like that way forever. Uh, there are also uh, efforts that we're putting in place to relook at the type of design uh, to make it safer as well as uh, less uh, intrusive to the uh, recreational users. Yep. Thank you. Richard. I've uh, found it very interesting seeing the blue boys go out there uh, and quite frankly, if you wanted to get ashore, you could just go around either end of the blue boys. I have on many occasions had to bring with, with my boat, pull some people off who the tides have changed and they've found that they've got a two, two and a half knot tide and they cannot uh, paddle anymore and they're waving and calling for help. Uh, with respect, I have never seen any of the government 
uh, MPA, uh, police, PSA, vessels going and pulling them off. It's always been pleasure craft that are doing it. Uh, and I look at the Blue Boys and I, I, around Sentosa and I shake my head because it is so easy, if you want to, to go inside those Blue Boys and go along. Uh, I'm sure there's a very good reason for it, but I haven't, haven't seen it yet. Uh, and I hear the explanations, but I still haven't seen how effective they are. But it does cause the canoes quite a lot of trouble. I will say that they are something that they can hang on to, but uh, I've felt very distressed youngsters uh, hanging on there and crying and things like that before we've pulled them off. Thank you. Yes, man. you yeah, um, I wouldn't say that the FSBs are 100%. Uh, it's not possible to really fence up the whole place. Some of these openings are actually deliberate um, because we need to facilitate, like for example, there are some access points to Sentosa itself, Sentosa Cove, so we have to leave some openings there. So it's deliberate as well as for maintenance. Um, but from a security perspective, if an intruder is coming in from outside our waters, if they're coming at a, at a full speed, at a wide open trotter, um, usually it happens at night. So the barriers actually serve as a physical line to prevent a boat from beaching directly on our shores, unless they know exactly where to go for. As to why um, there hasn't been, I mean, um, there's been a lot of rescues involving our pleasure craft community. Um, I think this is really also arising from the mode of communications that they have adopted. Uh, many of times, uh, these kayakers go out, um, they do not have means to communicate, to call for help. Uh, so we're actually also reaching out to some of these uh, communities to share with them. Um, like for example, they could have a portable VHF to alert or to at least have a mobile. Uh, most mobile phones now actually can go into water. Uh, so at least to be able to call back and uh, request for assistance. Yeah. Um. Uh, just to comment on that, I have been requested by the police and by the MPA to go and pull people off from their boats, saying, pointing out and saying, could you give that a hand? I happen to, could you go and help those people? I've also known in 115 Marina that they've been called up and asked to send out a boat to assist and that's been, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, I don't see the, uh, uh, the director of the Marine from 115 here, but that I've been in his office and discussed this matter. So uh, the, the, there is a, a certain amount of passing the buck uh, along to uh, the pleasure craft to do it. Now, I have got no objections whatsoever about that, but by the same token, if you tow another boat and you see a boat in distress or the, without engi engine and they are drifting and you go and tow it, you will be told by the authority that you've got no rights to tow this boat. <laughs> I have had that happen to me twice where I've been towing another boat that's been drifting down uh, towards the Keppel fairway and uh, I've been told when I've gone around and picked them up and been towing them along and I've said, you've got no right to tow, you've got to get somebody to tow that boat. You're not a licensed boat. Okay, so that is that is a fact, <laughs> but I'll leave it to we'll respond we'll, to that. Uh, yep. Of we'll course. Let Sean have the final word because this is going to take a long answer, but go ahead, Sean. Sure. Uh, I think most importantly is that if there's a, if there's a craft in distress, um, if another craft were to provide assistance, uh, we have no objection. Um, but in, in terms of uh, how the message was communicated, so uh, perhaps we need to look into that. Um, but uh, I will state our position is that, again, if perhaps you see a craft in distress, you're providing assistance to them. Please go ahead because safety is at stake. Yeah. Uh, I also want to address... Um, uh, there was this about the blue barriers uh, in the larger context um, 
is about issue is with the peddlers and uh, perhaps they, they pedal too close to the barriers. Uh, we do see an increase in a uh, number of uh, accidents in, as in kayakers and perhaps canoes requiring, requiring assistance, uh, especially at the Puran Channel area. As you know, uh, the current there is stronger and perhaps during COVID-19, um, th there is an increased number of kayaking activities whereby um, they don't go out as a big group, they just go out as in a very small group, but, but they are not familiar with the waters. Perhaps they, they launch in Sentosa or somewhere, and you know, Buran Channel is an area where you can see uh, Sentosa, a good view of uh, mainland Singapore. They go in there, and I mean, they do not deliberately um, paddle close to the blue barriers, but because of the current, they get themselves capsized. And of course, I, I thank the Pleasure Craft community for providing assistance. But once I'm um, sure MPA or PCG, once we get uh, informed, our craft, uh, we are also we also have the capabilities to provide assistance as well. So um, I think uh, come comes back to the point of uh, communication and engagement. It is important for us to reach out to the non-motorized uh, community uh, to inform them of um, you know again local knowledge, current where are the areas where it is more dangerous. Uh, so it's more, very important for them to have certain level of uh, proficiency before they go to their area. If not, it is important, you know, to have adequate safety measures in place so that, you know, I mean, if there's a craft there to provide assistance, great, but the issue is what if they are alone? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. And um, I, I guess that... that that conversation just now answered a couple of questions. Uh, there was someone who asked, what's a local radio VHF channel for distress? Um, as mentioned, a lot of kayakers don't carry a VHF, right? I mean, of course, we would like to make that um, part of your personal safety equipment, uh, but if you can't, handphone. Um, but coming back to the question about the channel and the phone number to call, all the marinas have been given a, uh, a small sticker, right? Um, and, and I think some of the associations have them as well. So please encourage your boaters, your kayakers, your SUP guys to, to have the sticker with them, store the phone number for uh, port operations uh, safety uh, in, the, in, in your phones. Uh, and just for, just for interest, how many of you know the VHF channel? Uh, those in MPA, keep quiet. Huh? Those not in MPA, what's the VHF channel to call for help? You got to choose from 1 to 99, come. Obviously not 77. Anyone else? Not 70, not 16. Anyone? They take a price, you know? No. Yeah. It's channel 7, yeah? Okay. So VHF channel 7, you get, you, you get help um, from someone. Uh, yeah, okay. From port operations control, uh, they will send someone. And, uh, and twice uh, it was Richard, so that was great. Um, and it's also good to know that um, from the MPA, it's okay to tow another vessel in distress. I've been towed three times. Um, fortunately, um, you know, I think I've got good karma. I, I, I've broken down, stood on my bow, waved my arms a bit, and then a, another boat came and towed me in. So uh, you've heard it from the MPA. It's okay to tow someone else in distress. So please keep up that uh, spirit of seamanship, spirit of helping each other at sea, because that's how we can uh, you know, get safer, get better. Um, we have another five minutes in this session, so I'm asking for anyone else with your last questions to, to put them up into the system so we can hopefully get to them before we end. Um, this is a very interesting question, you know, for, for all of us maybe. If there was one thing that you, or one change that you, you would like to see personally uh, for pleasure craft safety, uh, or to improve pleasure craft safety, what do you think that would be? That could be personal or professional. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it off the record, right? So no one's, uh, no one's going to get into trouble. But um, what is one thing that you think should change or you wish could change for the, for the betterment of pleasure craft safety? You know, well, for me, um, the best way to learn is through experience, right? So if it was for me, I would make part of the PPCDL course an emergencies lesson. Right? We bring everyone onto a boat, then we start the boat, we get the boat start to flood. And then we ask them, so what are you going to do? Or we set something on fire, and they say, what are you going to do? Because that's how they train us in the Navy, right? Fire simulator, flooding simulator, and we were all the better for it. I mean, fortunately, we haven't had to um, use that a lot for real, but, but I, I thought that really made 
the Navy a lot more comfortable at sea, a lot more comfortable being alone, taking charge and thinking about safety. So if there was something I could change, would be the PPCDL syllabus to have actual emergencies. Yep, and then see who panics and quits and, yeah. Okay, that's me. I, I would personally like to see more organized convoys of recreational vessels leaving Singapore waters. Now, just south of us, um, you've got the Ria Islands, right? Batam and Bintang. You'd be shocked. They have got more than a thousand islands to be explored. A couple of years ago, I actually sailed off um, one degree 15 and I went to explore the islands in Indonesia and you would be absolutely amazed uh, at the culture there. Uh, we just sailed down about 70 nautical miles to so this island called Pulau Buaya. It had a wooden jetty. Uh, villagers were at the jetty itself. We decided to lower the dinghy and went alongside the jetty. The reception that we had on that island was amazing. The village kids will come straight up to us, hold our hands and brought us to see the, the village chief who was so warm and welcoming, it was unbelievable. And he asked us what we were doing there. We says, we were just fishing. He says, okay, my guy will be your pawang for the whole day. We will bring you and show you where the tangiris are and where the golden uh, snappers were. Fantastic hospitality. You see, friends, Singapore is really limited. Uh, and if, uh, it, it would be a real shame if your boating is limited to just Singapore waters. We don't have very much to offer here, other than Lazarus and Plahantu. <laughs> so I would like to see the authorities, especially the ICA, help the fellow, help the boater um, venture out of Singapore waters to make the regulations a lot friendlier for the Singapore water. Because unless you go out to sea further and beyond Singapore waters, uh, your experience and your learning will be very limited. After all, boats are not meant or not built to stay in the marina. Boats are meant to go out to sea. Thank you. <laughs> Who was that? Huh? Was Roy, Roy, yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, from my point of view, uh, 90 over percent of the boat in Singapore are berthed in a marina or yacht club. So I would like to encourage uh, the mariners and yacht clubs to organize uh, boating activities uh, to educate them on the safety of uh, the use of their boats. Uh, we'll be leading a flotilla around Singapore waters for those exact or exact age and leading beyond Singapore waters for those Singapore or any other flag uh, pleasure craft. So from there, then the members of, the boating members would uh, gain knowledge and experience from the more experienced uh, uh, personnel of the mariners or the yacht club, for example, the dock master or the marina manager. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I uh, just want to touch on the personal responsibility. Um, that is, <coughs> as as the master of the boat, I think a lot of points uh, Captain William Francis has uh, brought up in his presentation, again on responsibility is, as a master, it's very important that um, you take care of the safety of everyone on board and also the boat. That means, you know, you carry out, I mean, for persons on board, if, you know, if you see that perhaps certain activities they are doing, there's a risk of them falling overboard, you ask them to wear a life jacket. Uh, make sure that the entire boating trip is safe by you know, knowing, doing proper passage planning, having the proper equipment. You have the knowledge of the local waters. Uh, follow, comply with uh, the rules of the roads so that the entire trip is safe for everyone on board uh, with regard to the boat itself. Uh, it's important that you know the boat, where are the areas where uh, there's a possibility that, you know, could be, a, you know, could, could result in, in 
in perhaps defects and you know, water entering the craft, you know, carry out regular maintenance because we also have cases whereby the boat goes out to sea, the master is not familiar with the craft. So the boat starts to take in water, they are no, also not sure what to do. So it's very important that you take responsibility for everyone on board and your boat. So make sure that you are knowledgeable enough to make the trip safe before you go out. And last point is about uh, emergency response. Uh, like what Terence mentioned, it's very important that you know you know what to do. Uh, you can't uh, you can't anticipate any situation that can occur. But um, in terms of emergency response, you should know what to do, who to call, uh, immediate actions taken. You know, with regard to most importantly, safety of life and then safety of craft. Thanks. Otherwise, um, okay, um, you know, just very interesting question. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, very interesting question came up just now. Does the PCG undertake PAC testing, especially after incident? Uh, I don't want Desmond to answer. Uh, my, my answer is assume it will be done, okay? <laughs> because no matter what Desmond answers about blood alcohol content testing, uh, no, yeah, just assume that it will be done. So please, just like when you're on the road, uh, don't drink and drive, yeah? Okay, so, so that, that, would be, uh, that would be the answer for that. Um, Okay, so um, we've, we've come to the end. I, I would like to maybe give, uh, open it up the one last chance to the panel. Uh, just maybe in 30 seconds or less, uh, give us your final takeaway about pleasure craft safety, about, about pleasure craft boating in Singapore, uh, what you want all um, uh, everyone here to take away from, from this session. Just one liner. A very quick one. Experience. Okay. Experience. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Whenever you see something wrong out in the water with a fellow boater, just remind him with these three words. Pal, observance of good seamanship. <laughs> Knock it down until they realize that it all boils down to common sense. Observance of good seamanship. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to encourage anyone who has passed the PPSDL uh, to remember the rules and the voyage system and all that. Uh, in, in our growing up years, when we pass the exam, we just throw away the books. <laughs> but for PPSDL, that knowledge is useful if you want to continue voting. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, for everyone that is like myself, uh, that is sailing actively for be it for work or for pleasure, I think, um, really to respect the sea. Uh, something that um, what you see calm is at the moment uh, will be very different the next hour or so. So really to respect the sea at all times. Uh, well, in addition to what I've mentioned earlier, um, for craft that, you know, in, I think there's some discussion about craft going out of Singapore port limits. Uh, for those who are going out, do register your passage plan with us. Uh, especially, I mean, do register your passage plan with uh, MPA so that we know where you're going. Yep. Yep. Thank you. And, and, and on my, my part, I would like to leave uh, you all with three lines that a very wise senior officer shared with me when I was in the Navy. Um, as a captain, right, always look ahead. Look ahead for safety, look ahead for issues. Always take charge because you're the skipper, right? You're the only one that uh, everyone's going to look up to. And of course, always, always think safety. Yep. And then you'll have a good day at sea, yep. even though the, the weather's not playing ball. So uh, on, on that note, I'd like to thank our panel. I'd like to thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for being a part of this lively discussion. And uh, I look forward to meeting all of you behind uh, over at the networking session um, where we can share more stories, uh, off, especially off the record, right? Okay. So. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Big round of applause for our panelists for their insights as well as a thought-provoking dis discussion. So can I now invite our moderator as well as our panelists up to the front of the stage for a group photograph, please. Over here? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> interesting for which.
Thank you very much, gentlemen. You may now return to your seats. Definitely, there has been a lot that has been discussed. I want to thank our audience for your participation in the pigeonhole as well. And ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the program for today. Thank you all for taking the time to attend our forum this morning. We would appreciate it if you could scan yet another QR code on the screen to complete a feedback form as we would love to get your views on today's session. Any methods which you think we can improve, please do let us know.